Today, I'd like to talk to you about my hope for how a technology can possibly make medicine more humane. In the not too distant past, there was a time where it was feasible for a single physician to know everything there was to know about medicine. That is to say, it was not only practical, but expected for a single individual to fit everything about medicine inside of their heads and then access that knowledge to care for patients. Even up to World War II, there were talented individuals in medicine who mastered vast proportions of everything that was known. Take, for example, Dr. Harvey Cushing. Dr. Cushing was not only one of the fathers of modern neurosurgery, but a pioneer in physical examination and in the measurement of blood pressure. He even won a Pulitzer Prize for writing. Individuals like this in medicine, in a sense, were reminiscent of scholars and scientists from the Renaissance who mastered many different areas and had a sort of encyclopedic knowledge of what was going on. This sense of knowledge and what it meant to be a physician had a really significant impact on the nature of the physician-patient relationship. Doctors were a kind of embodiment of knowledge in their person. And patients approached them almost as a kind of supplicant in the sense that they told a story and waited for the physician to judiciously apply knowledge to make some kind of conclusion, even a judgment on the nature of their lives at the current moment and their futures. But this model, this kind of approach towards knowledge in medicine is breaking down now. And it's breaking down first and foremost because patients fortunately are becoming more engaged and care is becoming more focused and centered on them. But it's also breaking down just due to the dynamics and the breathtaking growth of medical knowledge itself. Simply put, it's not possible for a single person to try to keep up with everything that's going on. It's not possible for one person to fit every single thing known in medicine inside of their head, regardless of how talented they are. And this is a major challenge for us in medicine now. Up to this date, what we've largely tried to do in addressing this growth in knowledge is to specialize and then even subspecialize what we know. So what we would do is basically break down a patient into smaller parts or systems, organ systems, for example, so that we focus on the heart or the lungs or the brain. And what this made feasible was for physicians to continue mastering their domains in the sense that you could still know everything there was to know or vast amounts about a particular area as long as you continue to break it down into smaller and smaller sections. And there are certain benefits to this. Obviously, we've made tremendous progress in medicine. Uh, and on some level, what else could one do up to now? It's a real problem. If knowledge keeps increasing this quickly, as it has, what do you do other than divide it up into pieces? But at the same time, this had real consequences that haven't been positives. So for example, when you start breaking a patient down into these different components and systems, it's easy to lose sight of the entire individual. And in that prior model, as flawed as it was, when physicians applied this kind of judgment, at the heart of the doctor-patient relationship was a narrative. It was a story. And it was the story that a patient would initially tell a physician. And at its best, it was a story that would be created by both of them as equals. And one of the things that's happened as we've broken down individuals into these sub-segments and fragments is that the narrative nature of medicine has been lost. And it's been particularly put under pressure by the way we practice medicine right now. You know, we're forced to see patients in increments of 10 minutes, 20 minutes. That's an average kind of th way that we have a clinical encounter with someone. And the stories just don't fit into that. This graph vividly demonstrates this problem. So on the vertical axis, we have the number of clinical decisions required to take care of a person. On the horizontal axis is time. And this is a, a graph from the Institute of Medicine. And what's daunting about this, even frightening, is the curve. It's exponentially increasing. And what that means is that even as bad as this growth in knowledge and data and information has been up to this point, it's only going to get faster. There's a second line on this graph that's worth noting as well. If you look at it, it's a horizontal red line. 
And that's roughly an estimate of what human cognitive capacity is over any person or set of person's lifetimes. Um, and the biology of the mind isn't going to change. It's going to stay relatively constant. And that means we have this gap that's developing between our capacity to sort through all this data, to understand the knowledge that's being produced, and what's really required to take the best care possible for a patient. And this is really part of a larger, so, so, larger story that society is going through as well. We're producing vast amounts of data because, because it's becoming easier, even cheaper to do so. But in turn, what's becoming put under stress, what's becoming more precious and scarce is human attention. We simply don't have the cognitive capacity to parsimoniously look through all of this data, to make sense of it, to produce value on the basis of what we can learn from it. And these are major challenges we have in or how to organize an economy, a society, the globe. So the question is, what do we do? How do we face these challenges? And it's interesting because even as daunting as that graph was, it doesn't tell the entire picture. If you look at most of the data produced in the world, it takes the form of some kind of narrative text. That is, it's unstructured. And this kind of data is a particular challenge for technology because it's not data you can easily put into a database. And if right now, if you can't put that data into a database, you can't really use it. You can't query it or ask questions to it. You can't derive insight from it. And when you think about how much unstructured data is being produced, through means such as social media, it's really quite a challenge. If we're producing all this data and we can't use it to enrich our lives, what are we doing with it? And this is a real challenge in particular to medicine. We're at the, in many ways, leading edge of this. So if you think about a patient's history, their story, their narrative, that can't be flattened out into a database structure while still retaining what it means. And that's an aspect of the patient-physician relationship that has decayed in many ways. And we can't return it just by encoding data back into these kind of databases. So what's the solution to this? How do we move on? If cognitive capacity is scarce and can increase, but data continues to put us under pressure, and we have to access more and more knowledge to practice optimal clinical care, where do we turn? And I think this is an area where there's a tremendous amount of promise for new classes of technology to emerge. Classes of technology that don't just generate more data, but support human cognitive activity in new, creative, and interesting ways. So let me take a back step back for a moment, just to explain for a second. So if you look at a lot of the most early examples of computing we know of, they were roughly almost like tabulating machines. They were kind of calculators. And the next model of computers were fixed program computers that would do one discrete thing. Take, for example, the machine that Alan Turing designed called the bomb during World War II. Its purpose was to crack the German Enigma code. Now, this was a relatively simple machine compared to what we have now, but it had one task, and it did it really well. After that, we moved on to programmable computers, and these are machines that could take many different kinds of instructions and many different kinds of data and put them to different kinds of use. And these have created the wonders or so many of the things that enrich our lives now, the internet, the web, mainframe computers. So what's next? If we have the strain on our human cognitive capacity, if a physician can't fit everything he needs to know in his mind, what do we do? What kinds of technologies can help support us? What we're seeing now is the emergence of new classes of technology and computer machinery, which in fact will do this. So what we're seeing is different ways of interacting with machines, different ways of supporting these kinds of cognitive activities. And the machine the technology we've des designed at IBM called Watson is an early example of these kinds of cognitive computing systems. So what is Watson? Watson was a technology that was originally designed to enable the following. A person could ask Watson a question, and then Watson would retrieve a correct set of answers. Now, underlying this, the technology is really quite complex. So what Watson is doing is taking dozens and dozens of different algorithms 
and having them interact together within a machine learning framework. Those algorithms in that machine learning framework are then joined to different kinds of hardware platforms. And Watson and the work from it grow out of a field of artificial intelligence called open domain question and answer. And roughly the purpose of this was to be able to pose questions to machines and have them elicit answers. And again, the entire idea behind this was data is growing, information is growing, how do we parse through it? How do we sort through all of this? How do we turn it into knowledge? And the classical way of trying to do this in the past was to try to almost anticipate what the kinds of questions a user may have would be and then store potential answers in a database. But just as we've reached a point where you can't fit all the information someone needs to make a good decision in the mind of a single individual, we can't cram all of that into a database either. So that approach has sort of exhausted itself. And what we wanted to do with Watson was push that further to see what we could accomplish through a different innovative set of techniques. And what we did was pose to ourselves a very difficult real world problem. And this might sound funny, but the real world problem we picked was the game show Jeopardy. And the reason why we picked Jeopardy because, is because it's a show in which questions are asked to contestants, and those questions can come from many different fields of activity. It could be science, art, whatever the particular show is, chooses to focus in on. And the questions are asked in really interesting ways that say a lot about language. The questions are filled with ambiguities, with puns, with double meanings. And these are all classically things computers really struggle to deal with. So we took that on as a challenge, and no one had really done anything on this scale before. But fortunately, using a great deal of insight, innovation, and creativity, we were able to really make remarkable advances in this area. And what Watson did was to be the two most successful people in the history of Jeopardy in a contest. Now that was great as a kind of proof of concept, but we know that what we were hoping to do with Watson is far exceeds the kind of thing that we did on a game show. We really wanted to make an impact in the real world and enrich people's lives. So one of the areas we picked to focus our efforts in, in developing Watson further was medicine. What could be better than trying to facilitate the use of this kind of new class of technology to aid physicians, aid nurses, aid healthcare workers, and make the lives of patients richer. So that's what we've set out to do. So here's an example of something that we're working on with Watson. So in this graph, what you see is how Watson handles a question. This is a question from a licensing examination for physicians in uh, the United States. So here, this is a question about a patient who comes in with a particular symptom. Here, it's a resting tremor of their hand. And what's interesting about this question is that it's kind of like a little story. It's a little history. It's something that you could see in a medical record. It's the kind of thing you encounter on day-to-day -day practice as an internal medicine physician or a neurologist. Many different people would see this. Um, and kind of a twist to this question is, while it starts out with a series of clinical symptoms, what it's asking is, where is the problem in the patient's brain occurring? So here's an example of what Watson does. It parses through all of the language in this question, and it extracts the ideas, the medical concepts in it, and links them together. And one of the real powers of Watson is that rather than come up with one answer, what it does is come up with a series of hypotheses. Each hypothesis is then scored based on its evidence. We search all the different sources of medical knowledge that we have at hand. These could be textbooks, journals, web articles, and then rank different potential answers. So you can see at the top, based on these different symptoms, Watson has said this could be Parkinson's disease, it could be Parkinson's syndrome, it could be a stroke, it could be an essential tremor. But then looking at additional symptoms, it creates a set of additional hypotheses. And it drills down and sees that the most likely diagnosis is in fact Parkinson's disease. And then the second challenge is, given that there's Parkinson's disease, what area in the brain is affected? And what happens here is that Watson generates another set of hypotheses, and it identifies different areas in the brain. And here, through purely automated techniques, Watson determines that the correct answer to the question is the substantia nigra. 
And this is roughly what we're trying to do, extract medical concepts by parsing language and extracting meaning from it, and then linking those concepts together. And this could have extremely powerful impacts on the practice of medicine and ways which really enrich the lives of physicians and patients. One example of what we're doing in the real world related to this is our work in collaboration with Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. So what we're doing is partnering with them to see what Watson can do for the care of patients with cancer. So in the very near future, what we're gonna see is even if an oncologist subspecializes in a single type of tumor, there'll be so many clinical features to know about that tumor that they possibly can't master everything there is to know and fit it inside their head. And one of the things people are very excited about in the future is this era of personalized medicine where treatments are tailored to the individual features of a patient's clinical history, of the biology of the disease, and their personal preferences. But this means that making a decision on what the best kind of treatment is will get down to sorting through and factoring in potentially thousands and thousands of different factors. And again, that's far more than any human can possibly manage to fit in their mind. So what we're doing with Watson is having the technology parse through these very high dimensional data, sort through it, link key features of it together, and then create a kind of presentation of that information for physicians to be able to understand. And at the same time, Watson is also examining different kinds of treatment regimens and protocols. And what the machine is set out to do is to match, given this patient's set of features or the characteristics of their disease, determine what is the best treatment for that patient. So the machine is able to link these things together. So this is the kind of thing that I was referring to before about how a new class of machinery can support cognition, can make it easier to think. And one of the key design principles we've built Watson upon is, is a really simple idea, but a powerful one. Computers are good at certain things and humans are good at certain things. And what's nice about it is that these two things can complement each other. So machines are really, really good at parsing through enormous sets of data. One of the sinking feelings you always get as a physician is when a patient comes in and it turns out they have an extremely long chart, a chart that might be as long as a book. And it's disheartening not because you don't want to read it and make sense of it and listen, but you simply just don't have enough time. Right? So a machine is really good at sorting through all of that. What machines are bad at, though, is making judgments. That's something humans are very good at. So what we're trying to do here is figure out this new class of technologies which can liberate human creativity, imagination, thinking. Rather than put more strain on human attention and cognition, we can free it to really focus in on what people are good at, what they want to do. And this I'm very excited about for the future of medicine because this offers a new way out for doctors and nurses and patients and all people in the healthcare ecosystem. Rather than trying to worry about how much they don't know or how much they need to catch up on, how much data, facts, and figures are burying them in their work, hopefully we'll be able to link these ideas together and summarize them. In a sense, hopefully through technologies like Watson, we'll be able to recapture the narrative nature of medicine that once existed, that linked together physicians and patients. That was a way of listening. And in doing so, I hope that this creates a new model through which technology enriches the lives of people inside of medicine, people who are suffering, people are trying to do the best that they possibly can under difficult circumstances. And in this regard, my hope is that through this technology, we can make medicine more humane again. Thank you very much.